Looks like this 719cc Kubota diesel-powered Honda Insight is coming along nicely. In the previous episode, we finished enough of this project to warrant a quick drive around the neighborhood. Well, the first drive proved to be very successful, and the only real issue is the exhaust needs to be modified to include a muffler. So, the car is drivable, but it's not roadworthy. Today, we'll try to bring this project to the next level and make the car roadworthy. Now, under the hood, we still have a lot to do. For instance, the glow plugs will need to be wired, the alternator will need to be wired into the electrical system, the starter solenoid needs to be wired into a switch on the dashboard, and what else? Oh, since this is a diesel engine, there's really no way to shut the engine off unless this fuel cutoff lever is pulled. So we'll need to install the fuel cutoff solenoid and wire it into the system. Now this car already has a custom lightweight electrical harness that powers all the basic and mandatory equipment like the headlights, taillights, turn signals, and whatever else that's required. So we won't have to worry about any of that stuff. And as I recall, all that stuff worked last summer when the car was last driven. And all we need to do is connect the chassis harness to the battery. Hopefully it's as easy as that. So basically, today we'll have to build a mini electrical harness that will control all the bits on the engine. And that'll work out to be about five or six wires and a few relays. Now, in order to pass the harness from the cabin of the car to the engine compartment, we're going to use this hole in the firewall. I believe this hole was originally for the air conditioning or maybe something else. I really don't recall. Anyway, it's a hole in the firewall and now it has a use. I reckon we'll need to 3D print a flange to reduce the size of the hole and just allow the wire harness to pass through. Now, once the wires pass through the firewall, we'll swing them around this way and then go this way. And at that point, some of the wires will actually connect to some relays before they'll land on the powertrain and then spread out to their individual locations. This will actually make the harness very easy to build. So let's take a look at what's going on inside the car. This switch panel is left over from the 420cc supercharged fuel injected Hemi engine that we previously had in the car. Yeah, that's right, a supercharged 420cc Harbor Freight engine. Now, if you missed those episodes, well, you can always go back and watch them. Anyway, this is the main power switch, and over here we have the starter button. Not much going on. Now, as I recall, this switch is for the windshield wipers, and we put the wiper switch here because the original switch weighed too much. Keep in mind, at one point, this car was powered by a 212cc 6.5 horsepower Harbor Freight engine, and we trimmed a lot of weight off the car anywhere we could. And over here is the horn button. Yep, yeah, that's lightweight too. Now, if we zoom in, you can see, indeed, this simulated carbon fiber switch panel is for race cars only, so keep that in mind. Anyway, none of this stuff works since we pulled the monster 420cc Hemi engine out, and we'll have to rewire the entire panel. Now, some of you may be saying, why don't you just use the original ignition switch? Well, a few years ago, we deemed the ignition switch to be too heavy, and it was removed, and now it's lost forever. So I took the switch panel out of the car so we could reconfigure it and rewire it for the diesel engine. Now, the two most important words of the day are simple and cheap. I'm sure there are hundreds of different ways we could go about this, but not all of them are simple and cheap. So today, we're going to try to recycle some of these switches, if not all of them, and add a few more. But overall, we ain't going to be spending a dime on this, because everything we're going to be using is stuff that I already have in stock. So let's see what we have to work with. So this simulated carbon fiber panel that's actually made from aluminum, well, it seems like a quality piece, and we're going to keep it. The main power switch looks like something you would see on the space shuttle, so we're going to keep that as well. This hole is for an idiot light. Now, the lamp we have is actually broken, but it'll fill the hole nicely. Now, this switch is for the windshield wipers, and I think we're going to mount it on this side of the panel. Oh, and we're also going to mount the horn button on this side of the panel, and that'll kind of keep everything organized. Now, for the starter motor button, we're going to be using this blue engine start button, and that'll go right here. Okay, so to stop the engine, we're going to have to energize the fuel cutoff solenoid. And to do that, we're going to use this red engine start button. So I reckon that could be confusing, but keep in mind, I'm the one that's going to be doing most of the driving, and stuff like this is easy for me to figure out. Hmm, which button should I push? <laughs> 
Now for the glow plugs, all I could find laying around is this very nice stainless steel push button switch, so that'll have to do. You know, a few of these buttons are absolutely not rated for the current we're going to pass through them, so just to be on the safe side, some of these buttons will only be controlling relays, and the relay is what actually will be connected to the load. Anyway, since we're reorganizing the switch panel and adding a few switches, I think we're going to have to replace this fiberglass panel with a fresh one. I reckon we should trace the shape of this old panel onto some fresh fiberglass, and that'll give us the basic shape of the new panel. Eh, that wasn't so hard. Now all we need to do now is cut and drill this fiberglass sheet, and I'll be right back. So off camera, I went ahead and worked out the positions of all the switches, and then drilled all the necessary holes. And this looks good enough for me. Of course, we'll need to paint it now. Hold on, and I'll be right back. There we go. The simple and cheap control panel is pretty much finished. Let's test it. Horn seems to work. Wipers work. Not too bad. Let's start the engine. Oh, let's not forget to power the glow plugs for a few moments. Eh, not too bad. If you noticed, I managed to remove the engine start text from the red button, so not only is this panel simple and cheap, it's very smart looking. I reckon all that's left to do is actually wire the panel and put it in the car. So wiring this panel is actually pretty easy because most of the wiring can be done on the bench. Once I get all the wires attached to the panel, we can then slip the harness into the car and then I can make all the final connections. Fast forward a bit and the panel's done and it's screwed into the dashboard. And we'll get back to that shortly. So the problem we have now is the hole in the firewall is too big. And that's not a problem at all because now we have this 3D printed flange that we can slip into place and close that hole up. Now obviously this flange has two holes. One of the holes is for the harness that we made today and the other hole is for the madman gauge that we plan to install in a car. But that's a subject for another day. Now that we got most of the wiring out of the way, let's talk about the charging system. In the past, we've been using this 20 amp alternator with an external regulator. I really like this setup because it provides just enough juice to keep the battery charged. And it's cheap, and I like cheap. Anyway, on this project, the electrical load on the charging system will likely be a little bit more than this alternator can generate. So, unfortunately, it's time to say goodbye to this 20 amp alternator and say hello to this 40 amp alternator. This 40 amp alternator is made by Denso, and it's actually made to be used on this little diesel engine. Now, something like this ain't cheap, and expect to pay about 70 bucks for one of these. The good news is, we didn't pay that much. This guy was sourced from eBay for a mere 25 bucks with free shipping, which is actually quite a bargain for this alternator. Now, for those who are interested, connecting this alternator to the car's electrical system is actually pretty simple. This terminal here goes to the positive side of the battery, and for this, you would use some thick wire. Meh, 8 gauge should be about right. For this electrical connection, you can buy a pigtail from the jungle site for less than 10 bucks. Now here's something to keep in mind. The color code on these pigtails appears to be random, and even though the pigtail has a red and black wire, that doesn't mean that's the indicated polarity. Remember, the color code is random. So this pigtail will plug into this connector. The top terminal should be connected to a switch 12 volt power source on the ignition switch like so. This bottom terminal is for the charge indicator light. Now on this alternator, the charge indicator light is completely optional. On some alternators, the charge indicator lamp is required and needs to be connected. But like I said on this alternator, it's completely optional. If you want to connect the charge indicator lamp, it's connected like this. And on this alternator, a 12 volt LED is fine. Some alternators require that you use an incandescent lamp, but this guy's fine with an LED. Okay, some people like to take a huge shortcut and they attach this top terminal directly to the output terminal on the alternator. Eh, that will work, but that means the voltage regulator is on all the time and this can cause the battery to discharge after a week or so if the engine isn't started. The best bet is to connect this terminal to the ignition switch, and if you want to charge a lamp, then this will get you there. Now, charge indicator lamps are fine if you trust that it's actually working. Personally, I like to use an actual voltage gauge to verify that the alternator is working. Anyway, that's the quick and dirty on this 40 amp alternator. These alternators are not only used on farm equipment, they're also used on race cars, and that's because they're lightweight and provide plenty of power to keep the engine running. Now, on our diesel engine, we don't need power to keep the engine running. We need power for the cooling fan, 
and possibly for the headlights. But we generally don't drive our project cars at night due to the deer and other marsupials that like to run around after dark. Deer are marsupials, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they are. Fast forward a bit and the car is more or less finished. Everything under the hood has been wired in and we even installed an air filter. Now, this air filter is pretty much temporary because when we do install the supercharger, the filter will have to be changed around, but for now it should work fine. So this 719cc diesel engine in stock form develops about 20 horsepower give or take and the 670cc Predator engine in the Renault makes a little bit more power out of the box. So which car is going to be faster? Well, the Renault makes more power, but it's also heavier. And the last time we had the Honda Wade, it tipped the scales at 1,480 pounds. That, of course, was with the 420cc fuel-injected supercharged Hemi engine. Now, that engine was certainly a lot lighter than the diesel engine that we just swapped in. However, in order to make the Predator engine fit in the Honda, we had a fairly heavy engine mounting cradle, along with some jack shafts and whatnot. I'm thinking at the end of the day, this diesel swap probably only added an extra 50 pounds to the car. But that's just a guess. We'll certainly find out soon enough. Normally, this car has a full interior, and we do plan on putting the rest of the interior back in the car. But first, we have to do some cleaning. You see, this car has been sitting around for well over a year now, and it's full of shop dust. So a good cleaning is in order. Now, at the back of the car, well, it's more or less a disaster right now, but it'll give us a good chance to see what was under all that carpeting. This big aluminum box was used to house the hybrid battery and the inverter. Of course, all that stuff's long gone, but we kept the aluminum box in place. As far as weight goes, well, this box is made from very thin aluminum, and it doesn't weigh much at all. And keeping it allows the lightweight carpeting to fit properly. I think it's a necessary evil. Anyway, let's take a look at the new switch panel. So this, of course, is the main power switch, and when I flip it, I have a surprise for you. Yep, that's an original type instrument panel for this car. And the good news is, the speedometer, the tachometer, and a few other things can be made to work again. You see, the speedo and the tach are not driven by the CAN bus. Instead, they use external signals that are easy to replicate with something like an Arduino. Of course, that's a project for another day. Let's check out the rest of the control panel. This button controls the fuel cutoff solenoid. And yeah, it appears to work. Let's check out the horn. Yep. Now for the wipers. Of course, we will never use these, but they're required by law. And let's see if we can get the engine to start. But first, let's power the glow plugs. Ah, this car is feeling more and more civilized. Let's make sure the alternator works. And yeah, it's putting out a solid 14.4 volts at idle. So this little alternator will definitely get the job done. And as a bonus, we only gave 25 bucks for it. Okay, so far so good. So it'll be interesting to see how this car performs when compared to the Renault. I'm sure it's going to be close, but when we add the supercharger, I reckon it'll be a different story. Now, I would love to take this car out right now, but in order to drive it on the main roads, we're going to have to have proper tags on it. The good news is, that's the next thing we're going to do. So, the next time you see this car, it'll be street legal and we'll find out how slow it is, or fast. Now, for the fuel economy tests, we'll be doing those as well. I'm sure a lot of folks want to know how far this thing can go on a gallon of fuel. I reckon that's about it for today, so we'll see you next time. Until then.